with the concentrations of the drugs that you're using. So two things. One is if they went too high, they seem to become senolytic. One of the strange things that always fascinates me is people are stunned by the idea of dose. Mm. And whenever you say, it looks like you have bad effects at high doses, I sit there and think, have you guys never encountered whiskey? Okay, trust me. All right. There's a really large evidence body that says one shot of whiskey is quite nice and a bottle of it has other effects. Why do we forget that the moment we walk into a lab and start talking about micromolar concentrations? Okay. So, yeah, the the compounds show a dose response effect. And I can explain why that is if you want to. But it's not terribly interesting because that's what most compounds show, actually. Right. So yeah, I, no, guess... I, I don't, you know, I don't like to, you know, I don't like to say, you know, I don't like to say this. You can see a toxicity effect with glucose. Try hard enough. Um, you know, if you stick enough in there, you start killing cells. So, yeah. you know, yes, it, it is true. Now, what happens is people, t- there is an interesting element in the literature, which is if people are using the compounds at toxic levels, don't be surprised if you get different effects from using them at non-toxic levels. Right. Um, and part of the reason we were interested in the range that we're down at, you know, the one to five micromolar range is, is a combination of two things. One of them was when we did our original resveratrol paper, um, we noticed that the compounds seem to be growth promoting at low doses. It's actually, it's, it's kind of sitting there. And we weren't sure what was going on. And me just desperately wanting to get the paper out. So it, it doesn't matter, which is always code for, you know, shut up and tell me something else. Um, but everybody else said, yes, it does matter, actually. Um, there is something going on. We started to take a look at this. And, yeah, you know, the, we've, we've published this now as well. At these low concentrations, you see these senescent traversing effects. It varies with the compound. The other interesting thing, of course, is these low concentrations are kind of achievable in vivo. That was where I was going. I mean, yeah, I thought it was. So, yeah. Are these, are the concentrations you're using achievable in vivo? Right? They are, they're, they're in the right range to be achievable in vivo. Yeah. You know, um, the, you know, 10, 10, micromo, um, 10 micromolar is not achievable. One micromolar is. Um, and that I think is is quite clear from the from the bioavailability of the compounds. So, and there's quite good evidence in people ingesting it. So we know you can achieve these in this level, these levels in real people. It actually comes very close to something that's very close to my heart. Um, and this is an area that hasn't, I think, been looked at nearly enough. Which is, we know people are taking in polyphenols in their diet, compounds like resveratrol and senolytics like fisetin because they're found in strawberries. All right. And there is a large body of literature associated with two lovely people, one of whom tragically is no longer with us, a gentleman called Jim Joseph and a lady called Barbara Shook at Hale who at the Tufts Nutrition Center, who have looked at the effects of feeding different fruits on a range of phenotypes, mostly cognition in rodents. And one of the things, and Barbara has actually managed to duplicate some of the beneficial effects on cognition in rodents in human volunteers. And one of the things I will be honest that occurs to me, and I think it's well worth chasing, is are people, you know, is one of the routes to, you know, you're much healthier if you eat your five a day. Are you actually taking in an elevated level of senolytics or senomorphic compounds like the resveralogs? Is that one of the things that it's doing? Because, again, you know, we, we always tend to have these sort of highfalutin talks about molecular pathways and telomeres and whether or not P53 is acetylated. And we miss the basic rules, which are there are about four behaviors that will influence your life expectancy by about 14 years. One of them is smoking, 
The other one is maintaining a healthy weight. The third is getting enough exercise. The fourth is getting your five a day. And if you have a com the difference between people who do, oh, and the other one is drinking in moderation. And if you do four of those five versus somebody who does none of those five, your difference in life expectancy is about 14 years. That is comparable, if you wanted to scale it, to taking rapamycin. And it is larger, or it's comparable to the life extension effects we see in mice-fed rapamycin. And it is larger than the difference between the, in life expectancy, between the most deprived and the least deprived boroughs in Britain where the difference is about nine years per man. So, you know, at that point, it's one of those, there are always, what should I be doing? And the answer is, well, do those first. And then, you know, then, then we'll talk. You know, I'm a great believer in, you know, there is a certain amount of try and, har you know, try and harvest the low-hanging fruit. But as somebody who adores food, um, I, I appreciate that, that that some of the fruit are not hanging as low as the bellies are. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's it's achievable. And I suspect if we dug into the diet and nutrition literature, some people are achieving it. Right. So you started off with resveratrol. So do we think that resveratrol is having this effect? So people who take resveratrol, is it having this effect of um, kind of reactivating senescent cells could it be we don't know and i would love to find out all it requires is a all it requires is a lot of volunteers and some money mm. but it, it is an all i think there are obvious areas that we can be picking up and should be picking up actually you know that is such an obvious emergent area that we need to be going into it um uh, you know, it's it's just a question of finding somebody to sign the checks. Okay, kind of. I guess going on from that. Um, so, have you you tried this in vitro? Basically, uh, mm -hmm. is my understanding. So, what is your? Are you planning to take this forward? Uh, yes, uh, yes. There are lots of ways in which this could potentially be taken forward. Mm -hmm. All right. So that we do have we do have some quite solid plans in that area. Um, but they're not ready for prime time. Okay, cool, got it. Um, so actually, just one question I, I should have asked before. So the senescent cells start replicating again, but senescent cells, yeah, they, they lose shape and they look different. So mm -hmm. did you look, did you see the, the yeah, phenotype the, 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 morph the morphology changes back. Um, the, the, the reversion appears to be, on the initial levels that we've done it, the reversion appears to be total. But one of the things to bear in mind is the deeper you dig into something, the more differences you will find. Mm. Okay. Now, and again, this is, yeah. you know, is a cell that has been senescent. The, you know, you could almost turn it into a straw man question of is a cell that has been senescent but has then been reverted absolutely identical in all regards to a cell where this never happened? No. All right. But then your cells are not identical to mine. And my cells at the age of 40 are not the same as my cells at the age of 20. Mm. The question is, are, you know, are your cells similar enough to mine to do different jobs, etc.? Yes. You know, are they, you know, are they? Yeah, they seem to be roughly similar. There are things that you would want to do in terms of rounding up the usual suspects. There are things you might want to do in probing function. But so far, uh, so far as we've taken a look, the reversion appears to be normal. But as I say, science is a progress report, nothing more. There isn't, there aren't any screaming red flags yet, if that helps. Right. Interesting. And senescent cells remember the type of cell they were before, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So they go back to being the right kind. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. No, 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 no don't, no, don't worry. We don't get T cells from fibroblasts. If we did, that would actually be even. That would be more interesting than the aging thing. Um, but uh, no, it, it's yeah. The, a, a senescent fibroblast goes back to being a um, 
a growing fibroblast. And, and we've done this with fibroblasts from different tissues. So yeah, they're behaving themselves. Which is, and that makes sense because effectively, if that, now my, my simple model of we're fixing telomeres <laughs> should be put in that mental bin for all uh, that says all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, now, if my simple model held, all we're doing is fixing a telomere, which I think is probably a little bit superficial, you would expect them to be fairly normal. 